Hey, we are beginning a brand new series today called Songs to Live By. And over the next four weeks, we're going to be going through a psalm each week. And um, I'm excited about that. I love to kind of pick through my way through a chapter or through a book in the Bible. Psalms, of course, is the longest book in the Bible, 150 chapters. And if you were to take your Bible and just open it right in the center, you're probably going to have it fall in somewhere in Psalms. Um, Psalms is, the word means praises. And um, the entire collection of Psalms is entitled Praises, actually in the Hebrew text. And rabbis used to call it the book of praises. The Psalms really are the hymn book for the Jewish nation. And it is still the same book that we get many, many of our songs from today. Actually, the Greek verb from which the, the noun Psalms comes from, comes from, denotes the plucking or the twanging of strings. So there's an association with musical accompanying, accompaniment, rather, that is implied with psalms. So every time you're looking at a psalm, you're looking at a song, a song of praise to God. And that's what the book of Psalms is all about. Very real. Actually, the book of Psalms is made up of five sub-books that were all kind of compiled together. And when you look at the book of Psalms, you'll see, okay, book one here, Book one, for example, is uh, mostly all David's psalms. Then you go to book two, book three, book four, book five. And so it's these books, the, the Jewish hymn book. Um, and so today we're going to be looking at Psalm 92. And just real quickly, at the end of the service, we're going to have our big give. We're going to also show you what our commitment number was for all in. So it's going to be exciting. That's how we're going to end the service here today. Uh, but we're going to jump right into Psalm 92. What's your understanding of the Sabbath? If I were to say the, one of the Ten Commandments, right? The Fourth Commandment, honor the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. What does Sabbath mean? Sabbath. Let me ask you this. Do you, do you have a Sabbath? Do you celebrate a Sabbath every week? What does Sabbath mean? It means rest, a day of rest. And we see the pattern for Sabbath start right in the book of Genesis, where God created the heavens and the earth in how many days? Six. And what did he do on the seventh? He rested. A Sabbath. A Sabbath, a day of rest. In Israel, they still um, honor the Sabbath. The Sabbath in Israel is Friday night to Saturday night, so sundown on Friday night is when the Sabbath begins. And if you go to Israel, so much of the nation is shut down on the Sabbath. And um, they'll, they call it Shabbat. And so everyone you see on the Sabbath, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom. So when we were in Israel, we had a group of, of pastors from around the country, most are, mostly the eastern seaboard. And we were over there, and they, they were going to take us on the Sabbath for a Shabbat dinner with... Um, a Jewish family. And this Jewish family in Jerusalem lived in this high rise. And so we go to the high rise and we greet the gentleman who's going to be hosting us for our dinner. And um, we noticed that the elevator wasn't working. And he's, I can't remember how many floors he was up. He said, oh no, we don't have elevators on Sabbath because we don't do any work on Sabbath. This is a day of rest. And I'm like, well, walking these steps is a lot more work to me than pushing a button. But nonetheless, we walked all the way up these steps to his apartment, and we celebrated a meal with him, which was just a wonderful experience as we had the hollow bread. And uh, one of the things that's interesting about uh, Shabbat and uh, when they celebrate this meal is that the fathers bless the family. And um, he said, because he was an older gentleman and his Children were grown up, and they said what they miss most about being at their father's table was the weekly blessing that he would pronounce over them every single week as he would pronounce the Shabbat, the blessing over his children as they went through that ceremony. But Sabbath is important, a day of rest. Now, of all the 150 psalms, there is only one psalm that is called, and if you look in the title, you will see it. It's called a song for the Sabbath, 
a song for the Sabbath, and that is Psalm 92, a song for the Sabbath. What's also interesting about this is the word Sabbath does not appear in this psalm, even though it is the song of the Sabbath. So this was a song that the people of God would sing to praise and exalt and to glorify the Lord on Sabbath. And as we look at this, we're going to see what does it mean to exalt the Lord? What does it mean when we exalt something? It means to hold someone in very high regard, to think or to speak very highly of. And so what Psalm 92 teaches us, it teaches us of how to exalt the Lord on the Sabbath, on the day of rest. By the way, I started this message by saying, hey, do you have a Sabbath in your life? Now, we do understand that in the New Testament, the day that we celebrate or rest the Sabbath for Christians typically is on Easter. It's the only day specifically um, where we recognize the Lord's resurrection, where He rose from the dead. And so, it kind of really, it, it looks like from the Jews, Sabbath was Friday night to Sunday night, Saturday night rather, that that day of rest, which is their Sabbath. Uh, but for the church, it kind of moved to Sunday mornings because of the resurrection. So whenever you have your Sabbath, your day of rest, it's a day to worship. It's a day to exalt the Lord, to exalt the Lord. And it's a day to do produce nothing, to do no work. I remember, I remember this well. Um, after we started the church here, um, 2005, there was about a five-year run where when we first started in this little brick building, uh, it was crazy. When I say crazy, it was just like it was growing so fast, we were just trying to keep up with it. We went from one to two to three to four to five to six weekly services in that little building. And I was, uh, you know, tons of energy, and I was running pretty hard. And when you're starting anything, to start a business, you start whatever, on the front end, it always takes more energy than when it gets going. And uh, just the way it is. It's like when, ladies, when you conceive a child, on the front end, your body is just pouring into that little baby. And so you're, you're drained, you're tired, right? When you start a baby church or a baby organization, there's a lot of work on the front end. A lot of nights, a lot of days, a lot of hours. And so I was running pretty hard for about five years. And um, I remember when I was 42 years old, the wheels started to come off. What I mean by that is I felt like, what about Bob? Do you ever see what about Bob? What's wrong, Bob? I have problems. You know, I had all these. But I would lay in my bed, and my body would just start twitching. My eyes would twitch. I had uh, these weird emotional peaks, and my, uh, my, even my fingernails, I would need my fingers to be squished, I'd say, at least would you just squish my fingers? Just take the tension out. I would <laughs> just, I would like tremble. It was just the weirdest of it. I couldn't control it. I'm like, my heart would start racing. Um, I'm trying to think some of the other things. I get migraines, like bad. And I'm just like, what is wrong with me? And Lisa said, well, you're, you're going to have to go to the doctor or you're going to have to go see this pastor that we knew down in Lewiston. Um, and I remember when he was 42, when he was my age, he had had a heart attack. And I mean, I wasn't overweight at the time. I was in pretty good shape, but I just, my body was not responding well. So I, I did not want to go to the doctor. So I said, okay, well, let's go down and we'll have dinner with this couple and I'll, I'll do what he tells me. And she said, I'm only going to do this if you do what he tells you. I go down there and he sits down with us for dinner. He says, listen, I'm only going to meet with you if you do what I tell you. So I was like in a corner. All right, I got to do what they tell me. And here's how he started our conversation over dinner that night. He said, uh, tell me what your understanding is of the Sabbath. I said, well, you know, the Sabbath is a day of rest. It's made for man. God made it for us. He showed in Genesis that this is his, the pattern. Six days you work, and then you take a day to rest. And, um, and he said, okay, now tell me about your Sabbath. And I said, well, you know, my Sabbath is Sunday. I'm preaching three or three times a week, three times a day rather, and usually busy meetings, whatever. And so you don't have a Sabbath. 
I said, no. So you're violating the fourth commandment. I said, yeah. He said, no wonder you're a basket case. And here's, he said, here's what I did. When I was your age, I wasn't taking my Sabbath either. I had a heart attack. And he said, listen, you've got to do this. Go to the doctor. Take a little vacation. But most importantly, have the rhythm of Sabbath in your life where you're not producing anything. How are you all doing with that? How are you doing with a day of rest to worship? A day when we focus our thoughts, not only give our bodies a, an opportunity to rest, but we focus our thoughts and our minds and our bodies and our voices on exalting God, on thinking highly of Him. And we're going to see four truths here in Psalm 92 that teach us to exalt the Lord on the Sabbath. Are you ready? The first one, how is God exalted? by His people on the Sabbath. God is exalted by the praises of His people. Let's look at the first four verses here. I'm, I'm reading from the English Standard Version here today. The Bible says, It is good to give thanks to the Lord. And so when we came in here today and we were thanking God in prayer, in song, it is, it is good to do that. Not to be silent, it is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High. This is a Sabbath. We thank God for what He has done. We sing praises to God. Well, I don't have a good voice. Well, you're lucky. The Scripture says, make a joyful sound. Make a joyful noise. Then say you have to have a good voice. If you got breath in your lungs, you can praise the Lord. Amen. Sing praises to your name, O Most High. Declare. See, this is all verbal. You're engaging your mind. You're engaging your vocal cords. We are giving thanks to the Lord. We are singing praises to the Lord. We're declaring His character, your steadfast love in the morning, and your faithfulness by night. It is good to get this rhythm in your life where you take a day to exalt the Lord with thanksgiving, with singing, with declaring His character, His faithfulness, to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. Again, Psalms implies that there is musical accompaniment. accompaniment. I think I said that right. And so we worship God, we praise God, we exalt God with our thanksgiving with singing praises, with declaring how wonderful He is, with music, with instruments. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. And at the works of your hands, I sing for joy. There is a time to be quiet in the presence of the Lord, to be still in the presence of the Lord. And then there's a time to get loud to praise Him. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. All right, we just say it. And we won't be silent. We shout out your praise. That's very scriptural. Yeah, but I like the slow, calm. Well, there's a place for that too. The point is not how fast or how slow the point is that your heart is engaged and your mouth is singing praises, joyful, thanksgiving, blessing the Lord. Come bless the Lord with me and let us exalt His name together. Amen. This is what we are to do on the Sabbath. This is how we exalt God. We praise Him. We give thanks to Him. We play our instruments to Him. We bless His name. We sing for joy. This is part of why we do what we do on the first day of the week when we come together and as Christians, our Sabbath is Sunday. This is what we do. This is the rhythm of life. This is the rhythm, the pattern that God has laid down for His people. And that's why it's important. I remember years ago working for a pastor who had four sons who were good athletes. And in those days, they had hockey on Sunday mornings. And he said, 
we will not play hockey on Sunday mornings. We will go worship God because we are honoring the Sabbath. And what was interesting to note, even though they couldn't play on Sunday, he made that a priority. All four of his boys became preachers, and all his grandkids now are preachers. My point is this. That if you prioritize praising God, it's going to pay off not only in your life, in your kid's life. People need a Sabbath. Think of all the young people and the way culture is today. So what, what they do on the Sabbath is they go do their sports or they go to the beach or whatever, and they don't have this rhythm of Sabbath in their life. And you look at their spiritual walk, many of them, it's pretty weak if they have one at all. No, but you're here. I'm preaching to the choir. Come on, somebody. You're here on the Sabbath, giving praise and thanksgiving to our great God. This is the song of the Sabbath. Now, the second thing that we're going to look at here as we go through Psalm 92 that might surprise you, that first one maybe was obvious, but God is also exalted in the destruction of the wicked. Now, say on that for a minute. Stop and pause and think about that. Because we live in a culture that is squeamish about these things. A culture that thinks that a loving God just means that He is unjust in, in the point that there is no holiness. You know, God is just, hey, He's, hey, Sarah, Sarah. You know, He just take your sin and not a big deal. I was reading last night in my daily Bible reading. I'm in the Psalms, in my daily Bible reading. I was read Psalm 12 and verse 8 last night. You know what it says? Psalm 12, verse 8. The wicked strut about when what is vile is honored among men. And you know what immediately came to my mind, and I... I Yelled out to Lisa, hey, Lisa, listen to this scripture. The wicked strut about when what is vile is honored among men. Hey, they're saying this is pride month. People strutting about, men strutting about looking like women. People gloating and taking pride in their sin, which is an affront to God with homosexuality and thinking it's, this is awesome. Let's showcase this to the world. We'll hijack the rainbow, and we'll tell the world, this is good, and we'll strut about. I was watching a little bit of the Queen's 70th Platinum yesterday, and the party they had in London. My sister and her husband are in London right now. They just happened to hit this week. And here there was a song, I can't remember who was singing, Rod Stewart maybe, or, and all these these guys come down and drag. And I thought the same, they're strutting about because people honor this. That's vile. Listen, the most loving thing you can do is tell these people this is wrong, an affront to God. It is sinful. If you love people, you care about them, you tell them the truth. God is exalted in the destruction of the wicked. I was reading, as you read through the first several Psalms, people say, you know, God loves the wicked and the evil. And Have you read the Psalms? Yeah, but God so loves the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Yes, He does. But He does not love wickedness nor evil. And love must be sincere. And you must hate that which is evil and cling to that which is good. How great are your works, O Lord? Your thoughts are very deep. The stupid man cannot know. The fool cannot understand this. What is a biblical fool? Someone who does not believe in God. By the way, the biggest killers of the last century were not religious crusades. It was atheistic governments. Stalin, Mao, Pol Pot. These atheists are murderers. They're fools, stupid. They cannot understand that though the wicked sprout like grass and all evildoers flourish, they are doomed to destruction forever. 
That's why we preach the good news. What is the good news? You don't have to be doomed to destruction forever. Turn. Don't burn, right? Turn from your sin. Put your trust in Christ. But those that live like this, this wicked, they are doomed to destruction forever. But you, O Lord, are on high forever. You, O Lord, are on high forever. For behold, your enemies, O Lord, for behold, your enemies shall perish, and all evildoers will be scattered. That judgment of God is clear all through Scripture. His judgment will be just as He will punish wickedness, vileness, and He will vindicate His own holiness with this justice. You know what justice is? It is equal treatment under the law. And under God's law, we have all sinned and come short of His glory. But here is the good news. You can end up on the mercy side if you put your trust and faith in the Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's our job, is to preach the gospel, the good news to people, so they end up on the mercy side of God's holiness. Because those who do not turn and repent will be doomed to destruction forever, and God will receive glory and be exalted with the destruction of the wicked, His justice and His holiness. And when we praise God on the Sabbath for the coming judgment... We remember the importance of rejecting worldliness to pursue true godliness. That message does not bode well in the progressive church today. That just kind of try to paint a picture that, you know what, you're okay. However you are, you're okay. It's not the message of Scripture. We're not okay. We need the mercy of God. We need a Savior. We have real guilt before God for our sins, and we really need mercy and forgiveness, and that is found through faith in Christ. Amen. Third thing is this. God is exalted in the flourishing of the righteous. When the righteous are worshiping on the Sabbath, when the righteous are living a life that brings honor and glory to God, God receives praise through his people. But you have exalted my horn, David said, like that of the wild ox, and you have poured over me fresh oil. That's the anointing, the Holy Spirit, a type of the Holy Spirit. And my eyes have seen the downfall of my enemies, and my ears have heard the doom of my evil assailants. But the righteous flourish like the palm tree, the palm tree. Palms are beautiful. You know how many different types of palm trees there are around the world? It's amazing how many different types of palm trees. It's a sign of Zionism. The palm tree was the sign. Um, it's, what they, it's what they said when Jesus came down the palm road towards Gethsemane on Palm Sunday. They, will, they wave palm branches, Hosanna. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Save us now, O Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The righteous, they flourish like the palm tree, and they grow like a cedar in Lebanon. I love these next two verses. They are planted in the house of the Lord. You know, a lot of people aren't planted in the house of the Lord because they can't find the perfect pot. And so they just pick their little seed on up and move wherever they want to go. You've heard the saying, you know, if you ever find the perfect church, don't, jo don't join it, it won't be perfect anymore. You need to be planted in a house of the Lord on the Sabbath. They will flourish in the courts of our God. Don't you love this language? The righteous flourish. The righteous grow. The righteous are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. I like this next one too, especially as I get older. They still bear fruit in old age. And they are ever full of sap and green. What's that speaking to? Life. They have the beauty of the palm. 
They have the strength of the cedar, and they are full of vitality, and they are productive even into their old age. This is the image of the people of God as a tree. And it is particularly appropriate on the Sabbath day. Amen. The tree doesn't flourish because it's clever. It doesn't flourish because of its hard work or its free will. It flourishes because of the work of the gardener who plants it in the house of the Lord and waters it and nurtures it and protects it. Surely God is exalted in the blessings He gives to His people as they're planted in the house of the Lord. Amen. Finally, God is exalted in the revelation of His character. This is the last verse, and we've been through Psalm 92 today. To declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock. Is the Lord your rock? Is He the foundation of which you have built your life on? Is it where your ethics and your morality and your money and your resources and your time? Are you built on the rock? Have you made the Word of God your foundation? He who hears these words of mine, Jesus said, and puts them into practice is, a, is like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. And when the storms of life come, your house will not fall because it's built on this foundation. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. So this Psalm 92 begins by exalting the Lord. You remember in verse 2, by proclaiming your steadfast love in the morning, Lord, and your faithfulness at night. And it ends by exalting the Lord, by declaring that He is upright, He is the rock, and there is no unrighteousness in Him. God, our wonderful God, has loved His own from eternity and will continue to love and care for them. And because He loves us, He is always faithful to His promises. He is completely reliable and trustworthy and worthy of all praise. God's character is our comfort, our great comfort to all His people in all circumstances and trials of life. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And as we remember the Sabbath, as we keep this commandment, as we seek to exalt the Lord through our praises, through our singing, through thanksgiving, through our instruments, through songs of joy, through upholding the righteousness of God and knowing that He will get vindication against and will justly punish the wicked for their unrighteousness, that He takes pleasure and He is exalted when His children are planted in the house of the Lord and flourishing even into the, their old age. And when His character is exalted, this is the rock, the basis upon which a healthy rhythm is established in the Christian's life, in the believer's life, in the children of God's life, and this becomes what sustains us and helps us flourish even into our old age. Don't stop being faithful to the house of the Lord. You know, like anything, the Sabbath can become a law, and we miss the heart of it and the reason for it. But Jesus tells us, and I'll, I'll close with this scripture, and then we'll get to the next part of our service here. Jesus tells us this, this scripture in uh, Mark 2, 27. He said, God in his mercy, the, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. God doesn't want us to end up like I did at 42 years old, a wreck, my nerves on end, doing work for God but not following the rhythms of God. God wants us to have a day of rest, to worship, to exalt Him. We need to build this as a priority into our life every single week of our life. It's God's pattern. It's God's rhythm. And the Sabbath was made for you because God loves you and He wants you to flourish. It's not a burden. It's a blessing. And on the Sabbath, man grows in grace and praises his God. The Sabbath is that weekly reminder 
that we serve a reliable God who will destroy his enemies and who will prosper his people in his time. Amen. All right. Well, I'm going to shift gears now um, as we get ready to close out the service. But first, I want to pray. And I want you to, in your hearts and in your minds, just ask yourself this question before the Lord. Am I honoring the Sabbath that God made for me? Am I exalting the Lord? Is it part of my rhythm, the weekly rhythm of my life? And if you are, continue. Good job. Let's keep exalting Him. Let's keep praising Him. Let's keep lifting up His holiness and His righteousness. Let's rejoice that He will see vindication on evil in this world. Let's marvel and rejoice and exalt and declare His wonderful, steadfast, upright character. We bless Him and praise Him. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we acknowledge You here today. We have acknowledged You with our praises with our instruments, with our singing, with your word and the declaration of your word. Father, we love you and we thank you that you have given us a day, a day to rest, a day to exalt you and to worship and to be refreshed and to reaffirm, Lord, our convictions, our gratitude for who you are. Lord, we come before you in confidence because you sent your one and only Son, Jesus Christ, to be the propitiation for our sins, to take our place. He made atonement for us. He made a way for us. And we come boldly before your throne of grace to obtain help, mercy, in time of our need. We thank you, Lord, for your steadfast love. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your upright character. Help us, Lord, to love the unlovely. Help us, Lord, to represent you well in this wicked world. And we pray, God, for all those that have an ear to hear what the Spirit says, to be open in our community. Let us be the light through our good deeds and through our good words that brings hope and healing to this community. Pray for our leaders in this nation. We pray, God, that you would give them good and godly wisdom. Lord, we bless your name. And we thank you that all over the world, in every nation, every kindred and tongue and people and nation, there is a people rising up that have been called by your spirit out of the darkness into the light. Fill us with your knowledge. Fill us with your word. Fill us with your love. And let us, Lord, make a difference for your glory and for others' good. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.